Make sure we've got sounds and everything like that. Uh, do let me know in the comments section uh, if you can see and hear me and everything is okay. So far, we seem to be doing well without any technical issues, but who knows? Um, who knows? Let me just check. Natasha is here. Natasha, can you hear me well? And Natasha wins first comment of the stream. There we go, Natasha Stanley. We have sound. This is going too well. It's not normally this smooth. Uh, this is good. So, guys, we have a fantastic guest this week. Each week, we bring you an expert stage hypnosis performer, people that are really absolutely out there smashing it. Uh, Roy Miller uh, says hello. Second comment goes to Roy. Well done. We don't have any prizes to give away, uh, but... Um, there you go, that's second place to Roy. So yes, uh, he is an absolute legend within the hypnosis industry. He is a screenwriter, a comedian, a producer, a director, a filmmaker, a motivational speaker, and of course he is a world-renowned stage hypnotist and performs all across the corporate market and cruise ships as well, so you know he is a quality performer and probably one of the best-looking, most handsomest hypnotists, on the second best handsomest hypnotist, on the circuit. So I'm going to play a uh, little graphic and then please welcome and make him feel very welcome at John Meyer. So please, without further ado, bang your keyboard, make some noise, and please make him feel very welcome, the one and only John. What he'll appear this side. There it is. Perfect time. Hello. John, how, are how are you? you? I, I am good, and I was I would say uh, maybe second best looking behind uh, my wife, who oh, is yeah. is a hypnotist as well. Not a stage hypnotist, but she is a hypnotist as well, and a former Mrs. Utah. So I yeah. Uh, wow. And well, and the joke is, people ask me if I had to hypnotize her, you know, to marry yeah. me, but no, yeah. I did not. Oh, it was well, done. I'll, I'll, I'll scratch consciously. That I'll scratch that off the list then. Yeah. yeah, I must admit, you two. Um, the chemistry between you two just exudes from any pictures that I see on Facebook and YouTube. Thank obviously. you. You 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 really do. You know you work well together. So you know, and yeah, it's, it's nice to it's nice to see a couple working together. Uh, being a performer, it can have strains on relationships. Yeah, you part, you doesn't understand. So yeah. And it's, it's, it's just, it's been such a seamless blend for us to go kind of from, you know, coming together and being a couple and then working together. And, and the thing is, is when we bounce ideas off each other, we know if the other person is giving us feedback, you yeah. have to let go of ego. Cause you know, you know, they're, they're you know, they're right. So yeah. it really helps. Yeah. Uh, very quick. We've got a couple of hellos as well. Carl Stowe uh, says hello. Uh, Brenda K, uh, phenomenal crude hypnotist as well, says hello. And Natasha Stanley says, we all know what type of guy Grant's for, Grant goes for now. <laughs> <laughs> Bless them. Uh, they were starting rumours. Uh, so first thing first, what was your first experience with stage, stage hypnosis? Who was the first person you saw? How did it come about? My first experience was when I was in college. I went to, uh, I was in college in Provo, Utah. This was 1993, I believe it was. And there was a guy named Richard Delafont, I believe was his such name. A, such a great hypnotist name is that as well. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I, you know, and the funny thing was, is I started doing stand up comedy and the comedy club in Provo was really good when I was there, you know, in college, but it would be one of these deals where they would do stand up comedies, you know, one weekend and, and you'd have a decent amount of, um, you know, audience members. But when they did the hypnotist, when they brought the hypnotist in, man, it was like they had ad shows. It was standing room only. And, never having seen anything like that in my life. I was, you know, I was mesmerized mm. by it, right? I was fascinated by it. Um, but then of course, coming from the stand-up comedy perspective, you're also like, oh, that's just gimmicky, right? So you're, I'm an I'm an artist, I'm a comedian. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. Um, but that was my that was my first experience with it. And then of course doing 20 years of stand-up comedy. Um, then later on saying, you know what, I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to do that and i don't care what my comic friends say and it yeah. worked out really well so uh, that hypnotist guy says all hypnotists named richard are awesome or most of them <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah we're not getting into that. I, and i remember his old you know his headshot i think he had like a a mustache you know you picture like the 80s yeah. mysterious you know kind of a kind of a thing i love that uh, i'm starting to see a little bit in promo now although 
a lot of stage hypnotists failed the or missed the class on like headshots and promo. Uh, yeah. Most of them look like serial killers. Um, That's but, true. Uh, yeah, we are starting to see you know, like a throwback to the old shows now, which yeah. I absolutely love as well, uh, which is, is great. Yeah. Well, well, I was going to say that was one of the things, at least when I started doing it. And I know, I think you had like one of my acting headshots up for, yes. you know, like the problem like that's that's my serial killer headshot my show headshot would look very differently but you know the the approach that i've always taken was the accessible approach with the audience yeah um i wanted to make everybody feel like this was kind of an everyday experience that normal people could participate in and not you know be the, the you know the the lightning bolt coming out of the fingertips yeah um, kind of kind of oh, a yeah guy. yeah natasha's just exactly says that so he says do you have a promo pick with the migraine pose is that the migraine pose? Is that the oh oh this yes yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm I pro yeah I probably do and some of yeah. the let's try this let's yeah. you know it's, the migraine it, pose yeah, it, I mean it works though because it kind of implies the 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 power of the mind stuff <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah um, so uh, twenty years of stand up mm -hmm. um, I was going to say do you think that that has benefited you as a stage hypnotist but I mean clearly it did. It really did because, I mean, not necessarily, I mean, I was used to writing jokes, but to be able to be um, connect with the audience, um, one of my skill sets, I was really able to riff with the audience and do improv, um, you know, with the audience. And that came into play, obviously, while you're doing the shows. And, and it, it came into play when I was, you know, doing my, um, you know, kind of my, my warm up you know, talk with, you know, yeah. with, with the audience to get them familiar. Now, what interesting, what as I did found find is that if I skewed too, too heavy on jokes, you know, when I was doing my pre-talk with the audience, yeah, that kind of made people a little bit hesitant because mm -hmm. the mindset of the comedian is I'm smarter than you guys. I'm funnier than you guys. So, you know, watch out, don't heckle me. I know more than you do. And if I came from that approach when I was doing my pre-talk, then I realized that that, um, that sometimes made audiences like, Oh, I don't, we're a little nervous to go up there with a the funny guy. So yeah. I learned I had to dial a lot of that back, but yeah. the ability to connect with the audience improv and be funny was, was huge for me. And I was able to take, you know, from the business perspective, I took all of the, you know, the contacts that I had, the managers, the bookers, um, people that were putting shows together. And I was able to go and say, hey, I'm doing a hypnosis show now. And that was a huge thing for me where a lot of people that may have gotten started didn't have any way to go with that. Yeah. They didn't have any place to, you know, get reached, anybody to reach. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, we all know that how important that pre-talk is. A show is won and lost in that bit. Mm -hmm. And having that comedy and the stand-up, uh, background, you were able to know that you needed to dial it back in again. I think yeah. one, of, one of the worst things is when you see a new hypnotist trying to tell jokes in the pre-talk or trying to be funny right. and then losing them for exactly the same reason. It becomes a, a cringe fest, if you know what I mean. So it's yeah. interesting to kind of, for me, I'd have thought having that stand-up would give you like superpowers in your pre-talk. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just about how you how you frame your funniness, and you know, it's interesting. Andre's comment there about how people got you know got started into it, mm -hmm. um, and I was talking about you know viewing you know the hypnosis as a gimmick, and I was a comic, and I wasn't going to do that. Yeah. The, the the turning point for me was I was booked to do um, a fair. I, you know, here in the, in the, in the U S County fair, state fairs, they're all, they're all big things. No, I was booked to do it as a comedian. And I think I was supposed to go on, I was supposed to go on at like noon. Now stand up comedy in a pavilion in the middle of the day, um, isn't as ideal as when you're in a comedy club at night. But, you know, I, so I do my show and it was a family friendly show and there was maybe, be, maybe three quarters full in the pavilion. And what I didn't realize was after me, their hypnotist was coming up. So when the hypnotist came up, it was like four people deep standing outside of this pavilion. And it was wow. like, they were hanging on his every word. And I was like, man, I go, okay, that's more along the lines of, of, of what I, you know, what I want to do. Yeah. And then conversely, the, I, I knew the guy that was going to, that, that was the hypnotist kind of a little bit for just from the entertainment circles in Utah. He and I went on to become really good friends, but it was seeing that me having to stand up there in front of a crowd of, you know, however many people versus everybody flocking to see him. And that was the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge to say, 
oh, yeah, I'm going to go do that. And thinking that he probably got paid more money, you know, than I did as yeah. well. So, yeah. I mean, what was your, um, tell us about your first show. You, you know, you've done your training, you've got, you've got a lot of your stagecraft already down from your background. Um, but what were the nerves like on that first show? Oh my gosh. I was, I was terrified. I mean, I, here I was, I had been doing stand-up comedy for 20 years. I had been in front of audiences of thousands of people. I have been on, you know, national uh, TV here on the United States. And I was never more terrified than I was in front of maybe a couple of hundred people. Uh, when I when I did it, and what I did was, I got together with a comedy friend of mine, and we found a local theater that we you know we would rent that we could rent out, and he opened for me doing about fifteen or twenty minutes of stand up, and then I went up into the show, and I don't know, we had you know maybe I don't think it was even two hundred people, maybe we had a hundred hundred and fifty people, um, but just freaking out thinking I needed this number of people here. And it's, you know, it's a throwing mud up against the wall and seeing what, you know, what sticks. And there was part of me that's like, I don't think we have enough people. We might have to cancel the show almost kind of giving myself a way out. My, yeah. my buddy was, was freaking out, but went up there and did it. And I was like, wow, this, this really works. And I think probably what I did from there was I did some more home shows just with friends. So I could just kind of build it up. Yeah. Um, and then I went to the, you know, the comedy club here uh, that my buddy owns in Utah and say, you know, can I do a, can I do a hypnosis show? So then I was actually able to do it in a, a regular place where people would go, you know, and, and, and do, you know, have be entertained. Yeah. Um, and then from there, it just, it just kind of um, spiraled. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, we, we spoke briefly just before the show about uh, kind of uh, Utah or Salt Lake City, especially being yeah. a Mormon, uh, a very you know heavy Mormon area, uh, and how that would have an impact on shows. Uh, but yeah, you say that yeah. you, you still work, you still work well, fine and well, great. It, it, yeah, it's fascinating because you know I was raised Mormon, even though I'm no longer practicing Mormon. But the Mormon Church in their handbook that they give out to their their leaders, it specifically says, um, you know, hypnosis is not supposed to be used for entertainment purposes. So no mm -hmm. hypnosis shows and that sort of thing. Um, so you'll you'll never see me do a hypnosis show at BYU. In fact, I was reached out one time by a group there interested in doing a hypnosis show. I go, oh, they don't know the policy, right? Yeah. And then they looked it up and they're like, oh, we're completely sorry, we can't have you here. Uh, but then Utah U Utah Valley University, which is 10, 15 minutes from BYU, um, I've consistently done a lot of shows there over the years. And it's the same demographic of people. Um, and it's and it's phenomenal. I would say Mormons are some of the best audiences, not to just hypnotize, but that really get into um, the experience. Because like I said, it was in Provo where I saw my first hypnosis show. Um, so yeah, no official sanctioned uh, hypnosis shows for anything of the Mormon church, but the Mormons themselves, every once in a while, you might get a Mormon that goes, now, wait a second, this isn't appropriate. We're not supposed to do this people. I've lost a few corporate gigs that way. Cause somebody yeah. in the went, Oh no, that's the church says no. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Natasha Stanley says, uh, uh, I loved learning about the founding of Salt Lake city in history. The Mormons went through hell. There we go. Uh, and Andre says, comedy versus stage hypnosis. A good comedian can always make and have a good, unless uh, could always make have a good, unless the audience is crap. A stage hypnotist has to get the right people to volunteer your thoughts. Uh, I think. Well, I mean, my opinion, uh, you know, and we'll get yours now. But I think the job as a stage hypnotist is, even if you've got a terrible audience, you know, your experience teaches you how to get blood yeah. from that stone to find to make a show. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, and it's true. And, I, and I've heard this, you know, before that you can have a great hypnotist, but maybe they're not necessarily really good showmen mm. or show woman, show person versus having, um, you know, somebody that's a good, uh, an entertainer that may not be as good as a, you know, as a hypnotist. So, yeah. but it, it, but it is, it's, it's having that balance of making sure that you do have the right group of people. Um, and then also knowing how to be able to be funny with that and balance that funny. So the audience, you know, is in with everything and the audience yeah. doesn't get put off by yeah. there being he's Oh, that's mean. Or, or, you know, it's spinning plates in the air. Yeah. You know, there's uh, yeah. a lot of there's a, say, yeah, it's juggling chainsaws that are on fire. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and you probably know you, you've had it too, where you've get done with a show and you're like, Oh my gosh, I just want to go hide in a hole. That was the worst thing ever. And then people will tell you that was the greatest thing they've ever seen. Yeah. 
And that, yeah, uh, a, a point you made then earlier as well, which was a great point. You said uh, when you first started out, it was like throwing mud at a wall and hoping stuff sticks. Yeah. And I think a lot of the the train, a lot of the books, a lot of the stuff that's out there is, you know, stage hypnosis is just a numbers game. But I, I think by if you can hone your craft on smaller audiences and through those challenges, mm-hmm. then that's what makes the more difficult shows easier in, in, in the long run. Yeah, well, I think the, the biggest thing that I learned early on was number one is you just can't you can't judge anybody. Mm. And I I remember I was hired to do a gig um, at a uh, a fir- I think it was Fraternal Order of the Eagles Lodge. You know, I don't know if they have those in the UK, but it's a you know it's a it's a a lodge. Yeah. And and I walk into this thing, and I think the average age, the average demographic was probably sixty. Yeah. Right. So it was a lot of older people and they were really liquored up. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is, and it was packed too. That was the other thing. It was packed. And I thought this is going to be rough. And then as it turns out, it, they were fantastic volunteers. It was a fantastic audience. So I, I, I learned, especially when I got somebody on stage, I, I you want to be open-minded, but never go, you know, that person's going to be great. That person's yeah. going to suck because then sometimes it's the person you think is going to be great that you, you know, that you dismiss. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I never have gone early on, maybe like the numbers game. Cause I, I hear a lot of, you know, hypnotists in their contract. We have to have X amount of people, yeah. you know, and you know, I've done shows for, you know, 25, 30 people, whatever the case may be. And you might only have one or two people, mm that volunteer, I think, you know, once I had three people volunteer and I kept, you know, two people, but if those people are good yeah. and you make it work, then it, you know, it, it is work then it's not as easy as when you have 30 high school kids on stage. No, but, but it's, it's, it's exactly like you said, it's, if you could, if you can put on a great show with one person, then when you've got yeah. 15, 20 people, it's a phenomenal yeah. show. Yeah. And, and I think and, it's been able to adapt to those different audiences. Yeah. And you know, the thing that, of course, the thing that I've always said, asking a hypnotist about how to hypnotize or how to do a stage hypnosis show is like asking a Catholic, a Baptist, a Mormon, a Jehovah's witness and a Jewish person, how to get into heaven, right? They're all going to have a completely different answer. And they're all going to tell you why the other person is completely wrong. Yeah. So uh, that's the one thing it's like, okay, you can listen to people's opinions, but in the end you, you just, you find out what, what works for what works for you yeah i think i mean for me the, the best advice i always give people is about experience the more experience you've got then the more you're going to polish that stone yeah uh, yeah uh, speaking of experience um we've all had those shows that we just wish we'd never had um what's the most challenging show you've ever had and what lessons did you learn from that um, it was funny that I was just talking about this with my wife the other day, a few years ago, I was hired to do two high school shows and they were both assembly shows, uh, in the middle of the day. And one was at one location in, um, uh, in Salt Lake Valley, very prominent school, which the kids were phenomenal. I don't think I saw an adult the entire time that I was there because the kids were the ones that were able to help me get set up with the show. I, I said it was kind of, kind of like Lord of the Flies if all the kids <laughs> got along and, and were great. And then the next day I had a, another show that um, high school kids and man, it was just, it was like rough. I mean, they weren't, you know, they were rowdy in the audience. They weren't uh, paying attention on, on stage. I had a lot of problems and, and I'm leaving here going, is, is this just me? It, it, like this was, and then when I got out to, as I was leaving, it was the end of the day. The parents were pulling up to pick up the kids. I literally watched two parents get into a wrestling fist fight in, in the, in the grounds of, of front of the school. And I went, no, okay. It's not just me. It, 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 it was them. But I think for me that I, you learn from that is sometimes just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you go and you think, oh yeah, it's a, I could do this. It's, you know, whatever. Sometimes you just, there's certain things you should probably, you know, just avoid. Yes. Uh, so we've got a couple more hellos as well. Uh, Jason and Nobby Morgan from Wales says hello. And Jeff Benning uh, says hi, Grant and John. Um, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, so uh, we talked about your most challenging show. Uh, what was the, uh, to date, uh, do you have a show that is a standout where, it kind of gives you that sense of pride. Have you done a show where you are kind of like, it was either a venue or something like that. That is your, your proudest moment within stage hypnosis. Well, I think probably one of the, 
pro- one of the most memorable ones is, is they had had Comic Cons here in Salt Lake, or now they call it mm. Fan X. Um, and I remember they asked me to do the f- one of the first ones that they were having here, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll go and do it. And you know, and as I'm driving there, I realize that I'm going up against. I'm in one half of the ballroom and the other half of the ballroom is William Shatner, Captain Kirk. And I'm like, <laughs> nobody's going to come see my hypnosis show. Cause they're all, it's like, I'm competing against Captain Kirk. And then they set up when I go in there and see it, the venue was set up for 1500 people and every single, I mean, it was standing room only in this wow. venue. I had 1500 people. And of course it's, it's a, it's a comic con. These people are dressed up, right? Their, yeah. their imaginations are already fired up. And uh, it was just a fantastic experience to have, you know, I think I had 30 people on stage. You're in an audience, you know, there's 1500 people. And I mean, you're just, you're firing on all cylinders because you have people that already are creative. They already have imaginations and they're there to have, have fun. And, uh, you know, and of course I've, I've had fantastic shows on the cruise ships. One of the things that I have loved about the cruise ships is that you're still on the ship. I mean, occasionally, you know, you might get off like the the day after the show if they're doing a turnaround, but having the opportunity to interact with some of the people from the Mm -hmm. ship. um, I remember in particular one woman, she said, the whole reason why I came up on stage is because you said that you were going to give us a post-hypnotic suggestion that was, you know, that could help us with our goals and achieve the things that we wanted to do. She said, I'm a chocoholic. I eat entirely too much chocolate. It's an issue for me. So I went up on stage with the intention that my goal would be to not eat chocolate. And she said, it's been three days since your show. And she said, I have not had any chocolate and and it's everywhere. How can I not avoid the chocolate? And she said, but I can't thank you enough for, for that experience. So, you know, you, so you have the, the entertainment side of things that are memorable. And then you have that that personal connection side of things with people that are memorable. Yes. Uh, also, uh, Natasha's going back to the comic and comic con. So please tell me you made good use of the opportunity to create superheroes and such. Yes, absolutely. Uh, on the cruise ships. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of hypnotists that try and get on cruise ships. Um, what was your first ship like? Because the level of production on, on ships is yeah. out of this world in comparison to, to a gigging hypnotist, you know, it takes it up to that real high level there what was your first ship like uh it was a it was a smaller ship i believe it was called grandeur of the seas for um royal caribbean um and man I, yeah you go into this this theater and you know literally there is somebody there to help you to do everything that that gets everything set up that makes sure the lighting looks good that makes sure the sound you know looks good how many times have i rolled into these corporate events where you know people don't know what they're doing and yeah. you know you're having to and man and the nice thing was especially once you go on that ship and you do that show they've got all your info you know plugged into their system. So they know what lighting you want. They know, you know, your, your sound and, and how everything's going to work. And of course I'm a pretty easy going, you know, guy. Yeah. That's one of the things that they appreciated about me that, you know, I don't have a lot of crazy weird cues and things that they've got to deal with, you know, some entertainer yelling at them behind the stages, you know, or stage or curtain or whatever it was. So, but it, yeah, it's super nice to just have somebody that's there to make sure those elements are firing on all cylinders. So you can just focus on what you, you know, what you do. And that's the hypnosis. Now, of course I've got 50 minutes at the most, yeah. you know, to do a show, which sounds just bizarre. I mean, in the beginning, I'm like, how do you do it? But you, you know, you, you figure out how to do it and makes you, you know, makes you a much tighter performer. Yeah. You know, you basically have about two to three minutes for a pre-talk about three minutes in you're inviting people up on the stage and then you got to figure by the the ten minute mark that you're into this show. You've got to have them hypnotized, so you've got at least forty minutes of you know of content. Yeah, I must. Yeah, the first the first ship I ever did was a big learning curve for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, that same thing when you're about the the sound checks. You know, my sound checks. I was always used to just kind of like, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. You know, and they got right. You've got forty minutes for your sound check, and I'm like, well, what am I going to do for the other? Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's brilliant. But again, on ships, the level of production is so high that show yeah. has to be on point. There's no, like you said, that fifty minutes, fifty five minutes, and they're not spending in the casino. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on, I'll I'll just bring this up here because um, you mentioned there about the therapy and helping the lady with the chocolate. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, let me just bring this up on screen very quickly. This is uh, your YouTube channel. Yes. Um, which is that? Uh, that should bring up a link in the comments section. Uh, your mm. YouTube is absolutely phenomenal. Thank uh, you. You've got some really great content on there on the therapy side of things. Yeah. I think this is something that you've, a project you've been working on since lockdown. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it was weird because, I, you know, first of all, I had my YouTube channel since I think 2005 or six, whenever YouTube started. And of course, that was about comedy and funny whatever and blah, 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 blah. I had clips of my stand up on there. Then when I started doing the hypnosis, of course, I'm offering CDs to sell at the back of the room, you, yeah. know, you know, with the show. And I thought, well, what if I put my CDs on YouTube, the audio on YouTube, people could hear them there, then maybe they would be interested. They'd go to my website and then they would download stuff from my website. I didn't even occur to me that people would just go to YouTube for, for hypnosis content. Yeah. And I wasn't a, active on YouTube. I just put the stuff up there and then I walk away. And then like a few months later, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is taking off. People are, are into this sort of thing. Um, so I focused on creating content for YouTube. And what I found out, at least for me, it's not just, it's not really stop smoking or weight loss. You know, the people that subscribe to my channel are into some more, you know, the new age concepts, you know, releasing yeah. Negative energy and creating positive energy. I've got one on there that's, um, you know, meeting and connecting with your spirit guides. So it's that sort of thing. And, you know, so over the last few years, and especially, you know, since the lockdown began, because people were home, they were stressed, they were looking for, you know, things to kind of help them alleviate that stress. So my, my channel officially took off. I've got my silver play button plaque from YouTube. Yeah. So I've got that for hundred. I think I'm up to, um, it's like 178,000 uh, subscribers. Say, yeah. yeah 178,000 subscribers, which is, yeah. uh, you know, round of applause for that. It's, Thank it's you. an amazing achievement. And it's, it's not a lot of people think you can go on YouTube and the audience will just come. There's a lot of, you've got to cut through a lot of stuff to make that type of impact. So, you know, it's a testament yeah. to the quality of content that you're putting out there. So thank yeah, you. Amazing. And yeah, it's been, it's been, a, it's been, it's been good. It's been um, obviously it, it requires a lot of work you know, yeah. you know, I'm constantly writing and staying on and, and a lot of, the people that subscribe to my channel, uh, you know, sleep hypnosis has kind of become a thing. So they, they want something they can listen to before they fall asleep and then fall asleep to, and then play during the night. Yeah. So a yeah, lot of my stuff is some stuff is like, like eight hours long. So like eight hours. Yeah. 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 So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been, it's not me talking for eight hours. You know, there's probably about <laughs> 60 minutes. That's the actual content. And then, you know, what I do is I, then I'll loop the body of the content for, yeah. you know, I'll lower, lower it a little bit, but it's weird. Cause you, then you'll hear from people and they're like, I fall asleep to you every night. And if I wake up in the middle of the night, I hear your voice and oh, I fall right back to sleep. And I'm like, okay, good. I appreciate that. It's, you know, it's working for people. Brilliant. And it's an amazing medium at uh, YouTube to, to kind of get that content out there now. And you know, I just, cause we were talking a little bit too previously before we started, uh, you know, rolling it just about embracing the, you know, the digital world, how things have, how things have changed. Yeah. And, you know, I remember in some of the Facebook groups, I think you, you, you and I both belong to that people have these debates, you know, should we st you still do DVDs of our shows and sell out, you know, or should we go CDs or MP, you know, and I'm, and I'm watching these and, you know, so it was a long time ago that, well, a couple, a long time, a couple of years ago, I said, you know what, I, I'm not even going to sell, you know, CDs or MP3s after my show, I'm just going to tell people at my show to go and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Brilliant. And so I wasn't, and being at kind of ahead of that curve, you know, really obviously, you know, helped me quite a bit to be able to build in, you know, the subscriber count. Yeah. And it's, it, it shows that you're delivering value. It's not about buy this from me or, you know, subscribe yeah. to the, it is, it is delivering value. So Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. It is, it is really good. Um, so how does that, um, you know, as we're coming out of lockdown now, mm -hmm. um, all those performers are kind of dusting off our show jackets and starting to look towards the road again. Um, what kind of challenges is that bringing for you? Well, I, I mean, I have enjoyed just sitting at home making YouTube content. Um, you know, I, I've gotten offers to do some shows and I haven't um, accepted any yet. There's a friend of mine, another local um, Utah hypnotist that I, I will forward a lot of uh, stuff to him. Um, 
at the same time, I think it's been since March of last year since I've performed. I I do have that that apprehension, that nervousness. I you know when I finally do a show, I know that I'm going to have to spend some time going back over everything. I mean, this is the longest in my entire life. I've been performing yeah. since 1992, 93. So this is the longest I've ever gone without, you know, without doing anything. So um, there's part of me that feels kind of nice. I don't have to travel and I don't have to go anywhere and I, I can just sit at home and, you know, do my thing. But then there's that other part of me that says the, the spark of the entertainer, you know, is, is, is going to rise up and I'm, yeah. I'm going to want to get out. So my challenge is actually saying, I want to go out and do a show, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But I think, I think with the other hats that you wear, the skill sets that you've got about being a writer, producer, you know, all those things, it does, it all builds upon each other. At random yeah. question from Natasha Stanley, she says on stage, do you prefer a hand or head mic? I prefer a hand microphone because yeah. 20 years of stand up comedy. That's just, for me, it's like that. It's, I don't want to use the word, you know, crutch, but it is, it's like, yeah. you're just used to, it's almost like it's part of you. Right. So I just, yeah, I like to do, and I know guys that do or girls that do the head, the headsets, and then they have both. And I, then you you're, I, I went through, I went through a stage of it when I first started, I had the handheld uh, and then I wanted a headset mic because I wanted to be yeah. like Anthony Robbins. Um, yeah. But then I realized that um, I didn't have as much vocal control with a head mic. Yeah. Um, whereas with a, a handheld, you've trying to get a better microphone and, you know, you can bring it closer for more dramatic effect and further away for off mic stuff. So for me, it's a, it's a control thing, but yeah, you're right. It's about, yeah. it is a good crutch to hide behind. Yeah. And that's, so that's just, yeah, that's all over. Oh, you know, like, there's time they'll bring you out a headset. And I go, ah, no, just give me the handheld microphone. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Adam Richard Dealey says, hey, gorgeous. I don't know if he's talking to me, you, or somebody else in the comment section. <laughs> well, either way, we'll just, we'll just accept it, we'll it and say, it, hey. We'll it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, gorgeous yeah. is. Is gorgeous we'll, is? A, uh, exactly. Is that a, a plural? <laughs> gorgeous is. Gorgeous is. Gorgeous is. Yeah. <laughs> gorgeous is of hypnotists. I don't think there's any photos of my wife in the background, so I know he's not talking about that. <laughs> some of my movie posters, that's, that's it. it. I have a couple of here of her. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, so yeah. So, what's your what's your next project? Where what are you doing next? I'm editing another YouTube video for this for this week. Um, that's really been kind of my my big push is just wanting to just keep content and you know going in that direction. But now, one of the things that I have been looking to do is how can I capitalize now on the exposure that I've gotten from my my YouTube channel? So I've gotten you know a lot of requests for you know interviews um there was actually a media company from new york that wanted to do uh not as an interview for like a, a some type of a media thing but they had a hypnosis idea mm. that they were interested in that they had talked to me you know about so i'm like i'm starting to get attention and awareness for people um relative to the meditation and the hypnosis space so i just kind of want to capitalize on that and keep being able to talk to people and you know go back out and do you know yeah. do some keynote speaking and that sort of thing Brilliant. so yeah um, I mean, I always ask this uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's always interesting to find out what books influenced people's journey. And two, it gives me a good chance to put an Amazon affiliate links in the description later on. <laughs> um, but uh, if you were to recommend two books to a kind of new budding stage hypnotist uh, on either stage hypnosis or personal development, uh, what are your two go-to books? The, the, what, well, one of the first books that I really loved and not necessarily about um, hypnosis per se, but it's by Joe Dispenza. Um, called You Are the Placebo. And Joe Dispenza's got a fantastic story about how he was in an accident and he basically rebuilt his spine through visualization and the power of his mind. And then he's gone on to become, I think he's a neuroscientist now. Um, but it's a fascinating book that talks about how people um, on both sides have used their mind both to heal their body and because of they believing things also getting, getting sick. Yeah. So that was a, a, it was a really interesting book that, that comes from the perspective of if your mind believes something, then your body's going to have, yeah. you know, a matching uh, res result, a yeah. result that reflects what your mind is. So that's a lot of things that, you know, and I, I kind of took that with, you know, with hypnosis, you know, if somebody's in that state and they believe something, 
then they're going to be able to have the result from that. So um, that's a really good book just to kind of begin to understand about how the mind works relative to being, you know, a placebo effect. And then there's a great book that I'm reading right now um, called The Mind Illuminated, which is about meditation. And it's a, it's a fantastic book because having done self hypnosis and the li- listening to other people hypnotize me, um, I kind of wanted to experience that, you know, the meditation state where it wasn't mm. necessarily somebody speaking to me, but me clearing my mind in silence. And that has, that's been a great guidebook. I would recommend that to, you know, to everybody that's looking to do, you know, meditation and even for a hypnotist, because it's interesting because the principles that we use in hypnosis to get people into a hypnotic state are principles that we kind of use in meditation, but from an opposite perspective. Yes. So it's, it's, you know, you, you want to have distract attention over here and dial down awareness and hypnosis where you're looking to have a balance of attention and awareness with meditation. So that one's called the mind illuminated. The so mind I would illuminated. recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, I mean, two fascinating books. Uh, Andre says, how do you decide on a pricing? Do you worry you won't get the gig if you ask for too much? Um, you know, well, first of all, it's interesting because Utah is an interesting place because people in Utah tend to be kind of cheap in, in general. Um, but uh, for me, I was really fortunate that I elevated fairly quickly that I did began demanding, you know, more money and I wasn't stressed if I didn't, um, get the money because I felt like I was worth something and mm-hmm. if I'm going to go and do it. So it's just like, figure out what you want to make what it's going to, you know, cost you. And then, you know, to go, if you have to travel or that sort of thing. And obviously it's going to be different if I'm doing a show locally versus, you know, if I have to fly to Vegas, um, you know, to do a show, but again, pricing, that's the thing that's it's in your mind. A lot of people have this, this limit and, you know, you just got to believe that this is what you're worth. And of course you and I were talking about this before we started, the, you know, when you start getting those higher pay gigs, then it becomes a little bit more stressful because you're mm-hmm. like, I got to dot my, my eyes and cross my T's because they're paying me way more money yeah. <laughs> than I, you know, normally getting from that senior prom grad party or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, so just see what the market will bear and then, you know, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think, you know, every year you've kind of got to increase your prices anyway. So you get to a point yeah. where you are actually quite surprised. And then your perception of your value does change with that as well. Well, you know, I have a very, very good friend of mine here um, that he's been doing sage hypnosis for a long time. And, you know, me only having been doing it the last six or seven years, but then me coming in and he's saying, I've got to learn to, to do your pricing because you charge way more money than I do. And I, it's just about believing, you know, what you're worth. And then, and it's interesting, once you believe that and you get that into your mindset, then all of a sudden you realize, Hey, that I can get more, you know, and more. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I always ask this question. If you were to give yourself a, a younger you, uh, a tip or advice, a golden nugget of information, uh, what would that be? Well, it wouldn't be to marry my first wife, but <laughs> if it was a professional recommendation, the one thing I've said about hypnosis is I wish I, I wish I had started doing it, you know, years ago. I wish I, you know, and when I saw it in my twenties, um, I wish that I had began then, but then conversely, I have no idea how 20 years ago people were using cassette tapes and records and CDs for music cues when it's like, now it's all on my, you know, my, my phone, but yeah, definitely starting earlier. Yeah. Uh, so but yeah. not, re- but not regretting not starting earlier, just diving in right now. And it's, yeah. and it's kind of like you said before, all these different elements of my life have all kind of converged into this moment yeah. from, you know, my stage experience, from my writing experience, my production experience and video experience. It's like, it's the it, universal it, lines. It's the perfect recipe to create mm-hmm. a great stage hypnotist and a stage hypnosis show. Whereas learning the hypnosis, the hypnosis is a tiny bit, you know, script writing, comedy, stagecraft, video production, all these things all make for a great hypnotist and a great hypnotist. yeah and 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 you know the the one thing too is it, it's almost a little bit back to andre's question but when, when somebody books a hypnosis show um you know they're not necessarily booking the hypnotist as much as they are booking you because yeah. there are other there's other people out there that you know maybe charge less money and you know and the one thing that i say about hypnosis is 
ultimately we're all selling, you know, cheeseburgers, right? You've got yeah. McDonald's and Wendy's and all these different places. Um, there's bacon, double cheeseburgers. There's, you know, cheeseburgers with grilled mushrooms, right? It's all cheeseburgers, but they're all unique in their own way. And yeah. people gravitate towards one because they like the way that particular one is done. So it's yeah. all about ourselves being ourselves. Yeah. Natasha Stanley says, if they won't pay what you are worth, then they are not the customer that you want to be performing for. Never yeah. undervalue yourself. Do you want to be Armani or Adidas? And there's, there's something to be said for that too, because, you know, uh, doing years of stand up comedy, there's been a lot of places I've gone in and done a show where, you know, it's, well, it's, we're, we're doing two for one night. So or we're doing this or, or, you know, we're, it's, it's a free show, anybody that comes in and the quality of the audience that you get that comes in who paid $5 versus the quality of the caliber of the audience that comes in, that's paying $20 yeah. is, is a completely different thing. So if people are, especially if it's a corporate gig, if people are paying money, you know, there's somebody that put this gig together for the corporation, the corporation's got money on the line and that person's going to want to make sure that everything goes off without a hitch and that there's not some type of debacle that they're going to have to deal with, you know, Monday morning when they go into the office. Uh, I don't know if you have a Stella Artois beer. Yes. Uh, in the yeah. uh, but they had a, an advertising campaign a few years ago uh, that was absolutely spot on. And it said, I think it's Stella Artois, reassuringly expensive. Yeah. You know, and there's a certain, there's a certain peace of mind that if you pay good money for something that you're getting something of quality and value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's true. Yeah, and, you know, and the, and the you know the the flip side of that too is there's, you know, when you have that persona that's out there, sometimes that's gone the, the opposite direction. You know, we had a particular hypnotist um, in the U.S. a few years ago that that had gotten a lot of uh, a lot of attention on a reality show, and it was interesting. Uh, I found out there was a gig that I had done every year that I didn't do. They they didn't book me that year. They wound up booking this individual that had gotten some heat from, you know, and when I say heat, meaning attention, yeah. Ooh, this is really cool from the show. Um, and then the following year they had me back because, you know, that little snippet that they had seen for a few minutes didn't necessarily translate, yes. you know, into the, into the, into the broader picture. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. When you start charging good money and you give that perception of value, you have got to have some, some content behind that as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I know uh, a few years ago here in the UK, there was a, a surge of new stage hypnotists uh, that were booking local theatres and, uh, and and putting on shows, and it and it didn't quite work. I think you've kind of got to – you've got to do it a couple of years before you put yourself out there at that level and do really well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate uh, it. Thank yeah, you so much. It's been great. It's great to speak to you, uh, uh, and it's 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 been nice to kind of hear your story. And an absolute massive fan of, of what you've done on your YouTube channel. As I, well. I appreciate uh, that. Thank it, you. Thank yeah. you for having me. This has been this has been awesome. It's oh, great. Well, it was a pleasant surprise for the middle of my day here. <laughs> oh, well, I must admit, yeah. Well, it's it's, it's evening here now, so yeah. I, I, it's one thing I'll never get used to is the whole the different time zones in the US. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it is craziness. So, yeah, uh, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for. for, for Thank you, Grant. Well. Appreciate it. So uh, yeah, Thanks. and uh, take care. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, John Moyer. Please do check out his YouTube channel. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and also check out his website, uh, his social medias and everything. Uh, John is a great Guy, uh, guys, uh, every week we bring you an expert stage hypnosis performer and uh, we have got some fantastic performers lined up for you. So uh, that is it from me. I'm off to go jump on another podcast on Clubhouse uh, where it's a stage hypnosis versus hypnotherapists. Uh, so that should be an interesting one. So for me for this week, uh, I shall see you later on. <laughs>